Secret Satan, Chapter 11 A good hangover feels like retribution, like a fitting comeuppance for having fun. Some hangovers are unearned and unfair, overly puritanical in their punishment. Some, inexplicably, never happen at all, and you wake up the next morning feeling curiously unscathed, and you spend the next day wondering when the thunderbolt is going to hit you. But some, the right ones, the just ones, are directly proportional to the amount of drunk you were the previous night. They are, in fact, mirror images of being drunk. You consumed, and now you feel sick. You swayed and sang, and now the room spins, and you moan. You filled yourself with liquid, and now you crave carbs and protein. You were full of energy and awful glee, and now the world is dark and your soul heavy with dread. You were the spirit of conviviality and friendliness, and now all you want is for everyone to go away and leave you somewhere quiet with a family pack of ready-salted crisps and a coffee machine. That's certainly all I wanted the morning after my night out with Ali. No, wait, let's be accurate. This is a murder mystery after all, and you never know whatever detail, no matter how apparently trivial or obscure they may be, might prove to be the fulcrum upon which the whole puzzle turns. The afternoon after my night out with Ali. There was a morning, of course. There was a one o'clock in the morning when I finally got home and a half past one when I woke up on the bathroom floor without trousers but with a toothbrush and a cheese sandwich. There was a five o'clock in the morning when I pulled myself out of a duvet-lined grave to drink a pint of electrolytes and take two ibuprofen. There was a ten o'clock when I managed to find a banana and some paracetamol. But it wasn't until lunchtime that I managed to get into some clothes and start thinking about finding somewhere that would sell me some ready salted crisps. What I needed was somewhere where I could be undisturbed, but also somewhere where I could be not so disturbed. It wasn't just that my liver had apparently processed the alcohol into a poisonous green gas that had now seeped up through my stomach to my head, filling the gap between my brain and my skull, giving me a dull, throbbing headache and pressing in on my frontal lobes, making it hard to walk and talk. It was also that the gas had somehow started my memory working. I am a forgetful person, I think I might have mentioned this, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'll say it again, just in case. Under normal circumstances, I would have largely forgotten the previous night, but now my brain had decided to start serving up, wholly unbidden, sudden vivid flashes of words said, things done, mostly loudly and with an aghast audience. There I'd be, trying to remember how to move my hands in order to make coffee, and suddenly I'd recall something I'd announced to the whole pub, and I'd have to curl up in a shivering ball on the kitchen floor until the memory went away. I needed something to distract me, something that would engross my attention and drown out my miserable inner voice, but also, given my current state of mental incapacity, not be too demanding or difficult. The British Film Institute was having a Christmas season of classic kids' TV, self-indulgent nostalgia for badly made, badly dated programmes, and I went to the cinema. For an ancient piece of seasonal childish whimsy, the BBC 1984 adaptation of John Macefield's Box of Delights was surprisingly moving. There were, in my fragile emotional state, a lot of tears. I wept at the Christmas enchantment of the opening titles, the haunting tinkling of Victor Heli Hutchinson's A Carol Symphony as the theme, the tune to the first Noel picked out on a harp over a sequence of weird folkloric images, wolves and Roman legionaries, Hearn the Hunter and Mr Punch made me cry sentimental tears. Then there were the tears of laughter at the terrible 80 special effects as the BBC's reach exceeded the grasp of the Quantel paintbox computer graphics system. Then tears of rage at the complete incomprehensibility of Macefield's plotting and the final revelation that it was all a dream. By the end, I was consequently entirely dehydrated again and entirely not prepared for bumping into someone from work in the queue for a drink. But there was Sue Park, already waiting, and there was I, unable to think quickly enough to avoid her seeing me. Linus! Distressingly, Sue seemed a lot more excitable out of the office. Are you here for the lion too? The lion? I said, not sure what she meant. The queue? The lion! said Sue. The witch in the wardrobe. You know, Aslan. The lion, the witch and the wardrobe, I repeated. Are they showing that too? Of course, said Sue. Isn't it great? Absolutely the best version. Well, better than the film, I said, thinking of the not very special effects in Box of Delights. Oh, definitely. It's my favourite anyway, Sue said. 
I actually own some of the costumes. Really, I bought them at auction. I couldn't afford it really, but I couldn't help myself. I didn't know you were such a fan, I said. Oh, I love it, said Sue, ever since I was little. Have you ever read the books? Read the books, yes, when I was a child, of course, I said. But I remember getting to a bit, uh, is it in Prince Caspian, where they, they meet a lamb cooking fish uh, that then turns into Aslan, and I'm thinking, well, this is a bit heavy-handed, isn't it? Voyage of the Dawn Treader, said Sue. And I don't see why it's any more heavy-handed than all those books based on Greek mythology or folklore or whatever. Point, I said. I, I think that they're just a, a bit self-satisfied, aren't they? Aslan's a, an awful prig. They're all a bit cosy. And what's wrong with cosy? said Sue. Life isn't cosy, is it? The world is scary for children and for adults. Look at what's happened to us, to Tony, I mean. It's scary. When I was a kid, my mum would find me checking all the wardrobes in the furniture departments and stores, looking for Narnia. Not that Narnia is safe, but it is reassuring. Like murder mysteries, isn't it? Reassures you that everything turns out all right in the end. Anyway, that's what I'm doing this afternoon. Checking the wardrobes, looking for Cozy. You should have a look for some too. She had a point, so I went with her to look. But I couldn't concentrate. Not because of the weird robot lion or my hangover, but because of something Sue was chattering about as we were waiting to start. It is scary about Tony, she said. Not for Tony, I suppose. Although maybe it was when it happened. But it's scary for everyone else. And sad. Death is always sad. Well, I think that depends on who's dead, I said. Linus, said Sue. It is sad. Even if Tony wasn't the nicest person, it's sad and scary and complicated. Everything gets complicated, doesn't it? At work, I mean. And then there's paperwork, finances and things. I wonder how that all gets sorted out. People's money and if people owe money to people who've died and all that kind of thing. I don't know anything about all that. Neither did I. Nor was I inclined to wonder about it. What I was wondering about, though, was why Sue was wondering about it in the first place. <laughs>